Hello and welcome to this episode of Superhero Ethics. Friends, the MCU decided to give us a Valentine's Day gift and we want to pass that on to you. As many of you already know, the official casting for the upcoming Fantastic Four movie has been announced. The movie that will bring the Fantastic Four into the MCU as a whole. Uh, And I have got myself and Jessica Plummer, who many of you may know as a... The person we really turn to when there's comic book news and and news about comic books translating to on screen, a dedicated Superman fan and a lover of so many comics and someone who really helped to educate us so much and someone who I know has a lot of passionate feelings about the Fantastic Four and their casting. So let me actually, I want you to introduce yourself, but I'll just start out by saying this. The thing is finally Jewish. Yes, and I'm very happy about that. Um, hi, <laughs> thank you for having me. Um, I love the Fantastic Four very much, and I'm really excited to talk about them. Awesome, awesome. And for those who don't know, we just referenced The Thing, Ben Grimm, uh, is a character in the Fantastic Four. And we'll talk more about it. We're not going to dive into it right now, but just to give the quick summary, because I think in many ways this is one of the biggest parts of the of the announcement news was always very Jewish coded in the comics and from the beginning was also very much a Jack Kirby stand-in character and eventually was made canonically Jewish in so much as even going so far as having a bar, uh even going so far as having a bar mitzvah on comic books on comic page if i remember correctly and at one point yeah. having a, a seder or something like that or no it was a hanukkah celebration uh but till now it's not been played by a Jewish actor and so this actor is Jewish and that's something we're going to talk about but there's a lot of other great news because certainly for me, Pedro Pascal and anything makes me very happy. I don't know about the the Fantastic Four having a magical baby that he has to like take across the galaxy or the planet or the city. No, that but, yeah, yes, actually, yeah, he has two kids. They're pretty magical. They okay, spend a lot okay. of time crossing the galaxy. They it checks out. It works perfectly. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Pedro Pascal continues to Pedro Pascal, as well as the rest of the cast being really awesome. So. Jessica, let me just start with this. I think a lot of people, especially if they're not hardcore comic people, don't know much about the Fantastic Four. Maybe they watched one of the Chris Evans movies or one of the newer movies, um, which are all, I think, generally regarded as not the shining high point of comic book movies, uh, nor the best adaptation of those stories. This is an utterly beloved story for comic book fans that most people who watch on screen don't know much about. Tell us about the Fantastic Four. Yeah, so um, the Fantastic Four are great. You are right. They uh, <laughs> they have been in many movies and not never really been shown in their best light. Um, uh-huh. So, but they're they're referred to as the first family of Marvel among you know by Marvel uh-huh. and among comic book fans because they were actually the first characters who were created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby when they sort of revolutionized comics in the 60s. So the Fantastic right. Four showed up in 1961. They predate um, the Hulk. They predate the X-Men. And they predate Spider-Man, who of course was not Jack Kirby, but still um, all those characters that like changed the face of comics, it started with the Fantastic Four. So... There are four of them, obviously. Um, Reed Richards, who is a genius. He is um, he was for a long time the smartest person in the Marvel Universe. Now that title officially goes to Moon Girl. Um, so I guess he's probably second smartest. So Reed initially in 1961 created a rocket to uh, beat the Russians to space. That, that They changed that a little and it's probably going to yep. be different in the movie. Um, and for some reason, he brings along his best friend, his girlfriend, and her teenage brother in his rocket crew. Um, as you do, as you do. <laughs> so the purpose of their journey is to study cosmic rays, and uh, they are affected by the rays, and they are given powers. So Reed gains the ability to stretch, and he becomes Mr. Fantastic. Um, his girlfriend, Sue Storm initially just gains the ability to become invisible. Later, she's able to create invisible force fields. She's initially called the Invisible Girl and later the Invisible Woman. Her younger brother, Johnny, uh, gains the ability to set himself on fire and also fly. He's the Human Torch. And then finally, uh, Reed's best friend, Ben Grimm, becomes an orange rock monster. And (laughs) Reed's like, we'll call you the Thing, because he's not always (laughs) the best friend. Um, And... Ben is like sort of a tragic figure because 
yeah. unlike the others, he can't turn it off. Um, they're very much a family, even though, you know, Reed and Sue do eventually get married. Ben is not officially, quote unquote, or biologically related, but they are they are family. Um, right. And uh, they were revolutionary at the time that they were introduced because they were flawed and they bickered a lot, particularly Reed and John, or I'm sorry, Ben and Johnny were always like kind of sniping at each other. Um, mm-hmm. They felt That's kind more- of the two younger brothers in a way of the, or, or, yeah, or Ben I mean, more of an uncle to the Well, kid. yeah, Ben, Ben doesn't really have an excuse because he's like 20 years older than Johnny, but yeah, yeah. Um, there's a lot of like the two of them playing pranks on each other and Ben, ha- they uh-huh. both have very short tempers. Um So a lot of bickering, a lot of just the characters not being perfect shining paragons the way that like Superman and Batman were. Um, And uh, but underneath that, there's there's this real core of of love and loyalty between them. Right. Um, And this sort of set the the tone for what the Marvel age of comics, as it's called, would become. You have these other characters who have sort of. a tragedy inherent in their nature, like the Hulk, like the X-Men, or who have these, not even necessarily flaws, but who struggle with things the way the Spider-Man does. All of that kind of right. stems from the Fantastic Four, and they really are the reason that modern superheroes are what they are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's really interesting, I think, to think about. And I, you know, we've talked, I think a lot of people understand that Marvel is the one that started doing relatable superheroes not kind of like the demigod figures and who had you know girlfriend troubles and high school troubles the way peter parker does but they don't really think about the fact that these were really the first ones of them and i I appreciate what you said about the whole like it's cosmic rays because Mm -hmm. to me what that also says is this seems like it's very grounded in like to our modern ears i think that sounds rather silly as someone who's been reading recently a lot more older science fiction that sounds very grounded in 1950s science fiction world, you know? And is that accurate in terms of also where that was drawing some inspiration from? Um, I pro- Probably. I have not done the reading on 1950s science fiction, but they are, like, absolutely a science fiction franchise. The right. Fantastic Four, you know, they, they have a, a home on Earth. They live in the Baxter building in Manhattan. But they are very much, they're constantly going to outer space or the negative zone or alternate dimensions or traveling through time. Their stories are very, are extremely cosmic and grandiose and they're like really imaginative. Um, I mean, they're, you know, it was a fantastic four story where Galactus first showed up, who is Mm. a villain who eats planets. Um, Right. That sort of, they have this quality of nothing is too over the top. Nothing is too silly. Nothing is too um, outlandish. Mm -hmm. Like there, there's a real core of like, letting your imagination kind of do whatever it wants. Um, And certainly Jack Kirby was absolutely doing that with the Fantastic Four until he got to the point where he couldn't handle Stanley anymore and left and went to DC. (laughs) But for a while there, his imagination Mm -hmm. was absolutely flourishing. And it's with the Fantastic Four that he created so many of the important, well, I was going to say important supporting characters of the Marvel Universe, but that's not, they became protagonists in their own right like black panther um first showed up in a fantastic four comic the inhumans like all these other really key characters and just to also sort of ground it in time you know we're talking about this as like to us today in which people go into space with not regularity but it has become somewhat scientifically you know understood how this happens when this was made Yuri Gagarin, the first human being ever in space, that as we understand it, uh, April 1961. Alan Shepard, the first American, is May. This comic comes out November of that same year. So very clearly, this is when humans going into space, and this is when they're going into like low, medium Earth orbit. So it's still very, very new. And so I imagine that's where a lot of the science stuff comes up comes up from. 
It's actually a little newer than that. It probably would have come out in September because at the time, cover dates were a couple months ahead so that the comic didn't look dated on the stand. So it was even closer. Oh, that's interesting how it does that. And and what would have been the normal time? Like, does it seem then that it's a crazy coincidence because of the how long it takes to produce a comic? Or does it seem like Yuri Gagarin goes into space, Alan Shepard goes into space, Stan Lee and, and Jack Kirby are in part inspired by that literally happening, they sit down and write, and then within two or three months, it's on the newsstands. I mean, I think there probably would have been time from April to September. I'm not super familiar with exactly how long it would have taken. Mm -hmm. Um, But they were both very aware of these sorts of things. Like, they paid attention to what was going on, and they were interested in outer space and technological developments and science like a lot of the stuff that they just in their careers it was they were often very current or um almost um prophetic um Mm. and you do get weird coincidences like um soon after that they would introduce the brotherhood of evil mutants um in uh, an x-men comic which was like within a month of dc introducing the brotherhood of evil in a doom patrol comic and like even the introduction of the doom patrol which is a team of quote-unquote freaks led by a guy in a wheelchair Uh was within like a month of the introduction of the x-men so there there were coincidences and this could have been one but i'm sure that they were at least paying attention very close attention to the space race even if right they maybe had started the issue before Right. Yuri, actually actually everyone knew that what the Russians, the Americans were trying hard to get into space. Right. And that's a big part of what fuels like Reed Rich- Richards' decision in that first issue. Um, but also, they worked incredibly fast. Jack Kirby once drew an entire comic in a weekend. So <laughs> who wow. can- the man okay. was in inhu- <laughs> the, right. the, the Marvel pun, he was inhuman. <laughs> but like he he was a miracle of a human being. Like, I don't know how he did anything yeah. he did. And we're going to get to the the characters themselves and the casting in a moment, I promise. But I, I always find these issues so interesting to really look at the history of it. You know, you and I have talked about how there's always been political undertones to to these messages uh, and sometimes much more overtones. In reading the original F- Fantastic Four, is there from Reed Richards kind of a like, rah, rah, America, I want to help us beat the Russians? Or is it more of a, I'm from science, I want to do this for science, not for you know, this Cold War mentality? Um, I wouldn't say... I guess there's there's an underlying, like, pro-America, anti-Soviet attitude, but it doesn't feel pointed. Um, mm-hmm. It's just It just feels sort of like the background radiation of being an American in the early 1960s. Like, it just... Right. It doesn't... Obviously, everything's political, like there's no such thing as a neutral statement, but I don't think that it's not, it's not like chest thumping patriotism, but there is an understanding that like, right, America good, Soviets bad, and there are definitely, like one of their earliest villains is the Red Ghost, who is a Soviet scientist who goes into space with three apes, and they all develop superpowers, and then he like, I don't know, robs banks or whatever with his you know, chimpanzee <laughs> that can walk through walls or I don't, I'm, uh-huh. I'm a nerd, but I'm not enough of a nerd to remember the separate superpowers of the red that's ghost, fair. three different monkeys. But like, mm-hmm. he's definitely like, that's a Soviet villain, but there's not like deliberately political storytelling. Right. That makes sense. And and the main villain I think today is understood to doc- is Dr. Doom. Mm hmm. Is Doctor Doom someone who's found in those very early books, or does he come along later? Oh yes, I think he first appears in the second issue. And now I have to look it up because it's going to bother me. Um, he, I mean, Doctor Doom is quite frankly, uh, no, I was way off. Number five, um, Doctor Doom is without like I, I just I will accept no other arguments, the greatest supervillain in comics. Like, bar none. I'm a DC girl, but... Interesting, okay. Joker who? Like, Doctor Doom is incredible. He talks about himself in the third person. He's an evil science wizard. Every time you think you've defeated him, it's actually a robot. Um, Uh In his very first appearance, he shows up. 
he kidnaps Sue. And we should probably talk about how Sue is treated um, Mm -hmm. in those early days because it's not great. Um, But he kidnaps Sue and he sends the three boys on a mission if they want to get her back. Back in time to steal Blackbeard's treasure so that he can do an evil ritual with it. And so they go back in time to pirate times. And then they can't find Blackbeard anywhere, but the thing becomes a pirate captain and he has the disguise that includes a black beard. And they eventually realize <laughs> that the thing is the historical black beard. <laughs> it's, I'm, and that's like, again, there's this sort of quality of like, it doesn't like it. There, there's no level of ridiculous you cannot do. Mm-hmm. And it's that that makes the Fantastic Four so great. And it's that that makes Dr. Doom so great. Like he's absolutely a very evil villain and he will do terrible, terrible things, but he will also like send them into the past to steal Blackbeard's treasure. I've watched enough. Our flag means death that now I'm having images of Taika Waititi, (laughs) uh, who is Jewish playing the thing, playing Blackbeard. Um, That would be incredible. I would like that. I would like that. So, why do you think it is that this property has had so much trouble being translated to film? Because obviously in more re- like we've had up periods and down periods of superhero movies, but even long before like the Snyderverse and the uh, Feigeverse and all this kind of stuff, we've had at least like, you know, pretty decent superhero movies. You know, the, the Richard Donner Superman. I know you don't think that they're like the best super- representation of Superman himself, but they're they're well regarded movies. The the Tobey Maguire Spider Man, you know the uh, even going back to the original um, Chris Carpenter, I think X Men movies. No, not Chris Carpenter, but um, I forget who the director was. But you know where Hugh Jackman first got started. Yeah, the two the thousands um, ones. Yeah, the Black Leather. Why is why? And, and my understanding is like the like I, I watched half of one of the Fantastic Four movies. Uh, I think I've watched all of one of the, the Christopher Evans movies and all of the newest version. I remember nothing about them because they were just pretty darn bad. Why do you think we've had so much trouble translating this beloved story into on screen? Well, I appreciate that you mentioned Superman because I think they have the same problem, which is Mm. that both of these franchises are fundamentally optimistic and positive and bright and sunshiny. Mm. Um, And that's not a thing that Hollywood really likes with superhero movies. There are definitely... Occasionally we do get something now that the MCU exists, we do get something a little bit brighter. Um, But certainly when the Chris Evans Fantastic Four movies were made, there was, that was part of an era that was quite self-conscious about um, being superhero movies. Like, I mean, I said the the black leather X-Men because there is actively a line um, in that first movie where... What were you expecting? Yellow spandex? Exactly. Yeah. Like, they're embarrassed about being superhero movies. You cannot be embarrassed to be making a superhero movie and make a Fantastic Four movie. Like, you cannot do that. They mm-hmm. are the first superheroes of the Marvel Universe as a collective universe. Like, obviously, they're predated by Captain America and Namor and some other Golden Age heroes. But the Marvel Universe as it exists... They are the first superheroes. Again, just like Superman is the first superhero of the DC universe. If you're embarrassed by the material, you're not going to make a good movie with it. And then I actually haven't seen the more recent Fantastic Four movie, but that one very, it was very clear from the get go went way further in the totally wrong direction. Like the first couple of Fantastic Four movies were bad, but they at least tried to have some humor in them. And they just went full grim dark with the more recent one, which is like, right. you don't understand the material in the slightest. Because very much like Superman, these are not vigilantes who have to hide from the government, right? They are, no. they're not the X-Men. The government, they're like, they're heroes to, to the people. They're barely superheroes. They don't really fight crime. I mean, they do. Like if they see a bank robbery, they'll stop it. But they're explorers fundamentally, which is mm. also, I mean, if you really want to get deep into things like... At the time that they were created, superheroes had been uh, out of fashion for some time. And what you saw both DC and Marvel doing was sort of veering away from 
um, the more traditional superhero with the secret identity and having adventurers instead. And so right. actually at, um, at DC, Jack Kirby had co-created um, the challengers of the unknown who I'm sorry, I, I'm this pedantic. I have to look up. Uh, uh, this is this level of pedantry is why you're on the podcast. <laughs> so we love it. Um, okay. First of all, forgive me. He did not co-create them. He created them. He was the writer too. Um, possibly with Joe Simon or Dave Wood, maybe, says Wikipedia. They debuted in 1957. And if you look them up, they're very, very similar to the Fantastic Four in that it's there's five of them, but they're in these matching jumpsuits, purple instead of blue. And mm-hmm. they go on adventures, like exploring weird stuff. And even the characters, there's like a sciencey guy and like a kid brother and kind of a gruff muscle guy. Like it's Jack Kirby had like one cast of characters and he was going to use them <laughs> over and over and over again. Like, you know, they, the warriors three in Thor, Uh huh. Yeah, they're in one. DC too, but they're furries. They're like, he, he they're. had, he had character types that he really liked. Anyway, that's beside the point. Um, the Fantastic Four very much come out of that, um, yeah, they're not exactly superheroes thing. And that's why even yeah. though they have code names, they don't have secret identities. Like from the very first issue, everybody knows who they are. They don't bother to hide it. Um, and they're much less focused on fighting crime than they are on exploring and going on adventures and expanding right. like human knowledge. I mean, in some ways, I'm looking forward to the movie, but in some ways it sounds like this would fit better as a TV show, you know, where yes. like e- either a modern one, but also just like, you know, a, a kind of like New Adventures of Lois and Clark or Quantum Leap or something oh, like that, where you please. have like an adventure of the week, but it's much more about just the the fun shenanigans of the crew. You know, That's the dream, actually. So Becky Allen, who I know has been on this show. Um, uh-huh. had a brilliant idea years ago when we were discussing this and their idea was that um, the Fantastic Four should be not actually a reality show. It would be scripted. But like the reason that they have powers is because they were supposed to be a reality show in space and it went wrong. Oh, I love that. Isn't that I amazing? Love- yeah. I I am very curious about the how they're going to do this, especially because uh, the... I try not to watch trailers much and things like that, but the initial indications are that this is going to be based in the 1960s. Um, so I'm going to be curious to see how this all plays out and things like that. Let's talk. Let's start talking about the casting itself, though. And my thought was, let's talk about sort of what you know about what you think is kind of the essential version of each character, because granted, like each of these characters has been written for. I don't like thinking about how long ago that was, but, um, you know, more than 60 years now. And like, you know, saying, what is Batman? Well, we have, you know, 90 years of Batman. We have 60 years of these characters. They've changed quite a bit. But let's start with Mr. Fantastic. Um, And let me actually just start by because, so from the little that I know of him, he is super genius, super aware of it, (laughs) not a playboy like a... I want to say Robert Downey Jr. Tony uh, like Stark. Tony Stark, Iron Man. It's the, you know, Robert Downey Jr. would be so happy to hear you say that. <laughs> yeah, no, very true. Very true. Uh, which is funny because they saw him in Oppenheimer. Very different role. <laughs> but, well, sort of. <laughs> but, you know, he has that same, like, super arrogance, but it annoys everyone because he's often very right. Um, tell me more about Rick Reed. Reed Richards. Well, I do. Reed Richards, sorry, I don't know where I got that. And let me actually start by, does he give himself the name Mr. Fantastic? He does. <laughs> he absolutely does. Okay, so here's the thing. And this is, I think, out of all the casting, this is why I think this is the most interesting casting. Obviously, Pedro Pascal is the most famous person in this movie. It is also the only example in this particular movie of race bending. Um, we've seen it before. Jessica Alba in the uh, first two movies and Michael B. Jordan in the more recent one. So it's there's precedent for the Fantastic Four. And <laughs> if you want to argue, we've seen it previously with Ben Grimm because, like you said, he's never been Jewish before. But mm-hmm. um, Reed is, as you say, he is a super genius. He knows perfectly well how smart he is. He's very aware of it. He does have a tendency to towards arrogance and um, 
overconfidence in you could argue that overconfidence is his defining characteristic because he believed that the shields he had created on their spaceship would hold and protect them from the cosmic rays. And obviously he was very wrong about that. And for him, that's fine. And for Mm -hmm. Sue, that's fine. Johnny's powers are a bit traumatic, actually, if you dig into it. Like I, I would like to fly. I don't really want to burst into flames and yeah. be a danger to others. But obviously it's it's Ben, who is Reed's best friend, who he loves mm-hmm. like a brother, like whose life was in many ways destroyed by this. Um, and there's actually a really wonderful issue from a few years ago where it's revealed that the reason that they don't have secret identities was because... It was a calculation by Reed because he thought if he could make them celebrities, he could make up for what he had done to them. Mm. So he is, he's absolutely arrogant. He's absolutely overconfident. He's absolutely very aware of how smart he is. He also loves his family so deeply and he wants to do the right thing by them. Um, He and Sue have two children, Franklin and Valeria. He struggles to be a good father but he tries. Uh-huh. And like I would say, if you compare him to somebody like Batman, he has a much higher success rate. He is very, very clear with both of his children how much he loves them. And like Valeria mm-hmm. is even smarter than he is. Franklin is not. Franklin has like cosmic powers. He's kind of a demigod, but he's only regular and like he's smart, he, but like right. Sue level smart, not Reed level smart. Um, and Reed makes it very clear to him like he does not love him any less because he is not as smart as Valeria like so he definitely has the good good parent thing that Pedro Pascal has on absolute lockdown right now yeah and the thing about Reed is he is he is a divisive character and I think people who are Fantastic Four fans do do love him um and people who are Marvel fans who haven't read a lot of Fantastic Four tend to not like him because when he shows up if you only see out of context moments, especially, I mean, there's a lot of stuff from the 60s, and you can find this for every character, where he is an asshole, or he's really sexist towards Sue. Like, Mm -hmm. that stuff absolutely exists. And I there's actually um, some interesting analysis of like, how much of that came from Stan as opposed to Jack, because the way that Marvel comics were created at the time was what's known as the Marvel method. Sorry. I'm like, this is so no, this far is afield of what you asked. This is exactly what I want us here. So the Marvel, so t- traditionally when a comic is the more common way that a comic is made is the writer writes a script. They give it to the artist, the penciler, and they draw it. And then the inker inks it, the colorist colors it, the letterer letters it. Yeah. The Marvel method, the writer, usually Stan Lee in those days, always Stan Lee in those days, comes up with a pitch, a story. They're like, this is what's going to happen. It's like a treatment. It may be more or less detailed depending on who, how much he knows and who he's collaborating with. If it's Jack Kirby, he could have been like, I don't know, they go to space and Jack would handle the rest, you know? Yeah. Then the artist draws the comic, which as, I mean, you can tell listening to that how much actual writing the artist is doing they're deciding so much of the story if they're only working with a pitch or like a one-page treatment or whatever it is then stan goes back in and he writes all the dialogue and we actually have some extant art of jack kirby's where we can see that like for example sue is making a decision to like attack a bad guy and in the final art Stan has changed the dialogue to have Reed be like, Sue, attack that bad guy. And so her decisions become Reed's orders, which is not to say that Jack Kirby was not sexist as, you know, any man of the 60s. They're both products of their time, yeah. Right. Um, But it's, it's interesting to kind of, see how much we can unpack how much of Reed and Sue's dynamic comes from Jack and how much comes from Stan. Anyway, back to Reed. Um, There's many, many images you can take out of context and be like, this guy's terrible, especially older issues. During Civil War, the the comics event, um, 
he was fully on the wrong side of history. Like he was pro-registration. He and Sue actually separated because she was anti-registration. He was involved with um, Tony Stark in cloning Thor and the Thor clone like killed people. It was, he made some very, very bad decisions and a lot of people Mm -hmm. have never forgiven him. Um, I love Reed. I think that he's, he's a deeply flawed character, but he, is trying to do the right thing. And I think it will be really interesting to see an actor who is so beloved in that role because yeah. so many people are predisposed to dislike Reed. And I think this is a really interesting way to combat that. Well, in that way, I think yeah, having a very well beloved actor and one who is very clearly not white, I think can be very useful because from the outside, part of what I saw with Reed Richards was I think in the last five to ten years, longer in some circles, but especially in the last ten years or so, there's been a general sort of like, can we look at the fact that so many comic book heroes are super smart, super rich, often uh, straight white cis men who always seem to know the answers, and maybe that's not great. And I think that is an incredibly needed critique and incredibly valid for a lot of these people, including my beloved Bruce Wayne and and hmm. Artie, uh, uh, Tony Stark and some others. And I wonder also if to some extent Reed Richards got caught up because I certainly often hear him listed as one more, you know, the super smart white guy who knows everything. Um, he is he is a very patriarchal character. I will I will say. He is usually wealthy, but the money comes from patents. He's not like old money or anything. He has earned that money mm-hmm. from selling his patents. But I, I'm sorry, I just have to mention this early issue because it's incredible. Um, there is an issue where he loses all of their money in the stock market. This is from the 60s. This is a, a yep. Stan and Jack comic. He loses all of their money in the stock market. And they're like, what do we do? We don't have any money. And then they get a mysterious offer from a movie studio to go out to Hollywood and film a movie about themselves. And they're like, they're going to get paid $1 million, which is really Austin Powers, you know? Um, And they have to hitchhike to get there. That's how broke they are. Um, And then when they get there, it turns out that the movie studio is owned by Namor. And he's like, dressed himself up in a little like movie producer costume with like a cigarette holder um and of course it's an elaborate plot to kill the three guys and marry sue Mm -hmm. and it's it's so ludicrous i have an article about it on book riot because it's my favorite fantastic four issue but but yes your your overall point absolutely stands aside from that one issue where reed went broke for stupid reasons (laughs) i love it i love it um, reminds me of Oliver Queen going broke in Arrow and and yeah, the the <laughs> understanding of the vicissitudes of the rich and famous of comic book is not always the best. Um, well, going broke is a huge part of Oliver Queen's character in the comics, but Arrow yes. maybe didn't get some things right. <laughs> Look, when you need to spend that much time pointing a camera at those very beautiful pectorals, you just don't have <laughs> much time for character nuance. As we transition into Sue, but also finishing up with Reed... Am I right that it sounds like they had some troubles, including the Civil War, but for the most part, this is the thing you don't find in Marvel, especially the healthy relationship that has lasted through most of comics? Yeah, I mean, they have been a couple since 1961. They got married when it was still the 60s, which is like Mm -hmm. shocking that that was not common. Um, There's a really cute moment at the wedding where Stan and Jack get kicked out because nobody knows who they are. Um, I like it. I like it. They, uh, there have been some ups and downs. They've definitely separated a few times, not just Civil War. Um, I mean, even early on, there was, as I alluded to, there was a love triangle with Namor. Um, but it was never, re- like, nobody ever thought Sue was going to leave Reed for Namor. Um, there have definitely been moments, often involving the children, like mm-hmm. Franklin as I've said, has his really immense powers that as a very small child, he could not control. And there's this issue where Reed basically has to make him catatonic in order to save all of existence from being wiped out. Sue doesn't take it well and like leaves Reed. Um, But again, I mean, that's an example of Reed making this very unilateral decision 
right. is extremely painful and destructive for a really good reason. Um, <clears throat> but still making it like he tells Sue what's going to happen. He doesn't he, make the decision. Uh, with he her. doesn't tell her what's going to happen. It just happens. And then she's like, mm-hmm. what did you do to our baby? Um, right. <laughs> Sue is. She's very much initially. Initially, she's very much in the mold of many other um, Marvel female Marvel characters from that era. Like Jean Grey is very similar. You'll see female characters tend to have powers that involve them kind of touching their forehead and squinting and then fainting from the mental strain. So, mm-hmm. you know, with Sue, it's the invisibility. With Jean, it's the telepathy or telekinesis. Um, they don't have physical powers. And gradually you see Sue kind of coming into her own. And there, the what's interesting is that there was pushback from it very, very early on. Like there is an issue where the Fantastic Four are reading their fan mail and Sue starts crying because people are writing in saying that Sue is useless. And mm. Reed looks at the camera and is like, Sue is not useless. She does all of our emotional labor. <laughs> <laughs> which is like oh boy that didn't help or like there's uh-huh. an issue where they're working with the u.s military and sue's like but what can i do and this general with this, like old mustachioed walrus looking guy is like it's always helpful to have a pretty woman along to for moral oh, support boy. and reads like that's how we all feel general and it's like oh, oh. do they ever have her like She's the one who has to put on a slinky dress and flirt with the person to sort of get the information, or do they at least avoid going that route with her? Not really. And when she does, it's usually like she will sometimes cozy up to Namor specifically because mm-hmm. she knows how he feels about her. And she does care about him, but she's she doesn't really do the honey trap thing. Um uh-huh. <laughs> if anybody does, it's Johnny. Um <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> She, um, and yeah, so gradually, like, again, it was really clear early on that there was pushback against how Sue is being treated. And she is given more of an active power. She's given her force field power, which these days, many people would argue makes her, in fact, the most powerful member of the team, because she can just put a little tiny force field in your heart or your brain and you're dead. Like, it wouldn't even be hard for her. Um... Do they ever take her the Jean Grey route of she's more powerful than all of us, so we have to control her in this kind of like patriarchal, don't let women have their power kind of a way? Not really, which is funny because in the 60s, Reed was constantly like, if Johnny ever turned against us, the world would be in danger. If Ben ever turned against us, the world would be in danger. But he never really does that with Sue. Um, It's just, which I don't think is um, meant to imply that she's not as strong. I think it's just like, people have that much faith in her. Like she's right of all of them, probably the most unshakable. Mm. I can see that. Can um, see that. And yeah, so like the thing is, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to be like, Oh, Sue sucked in the sixties, but then she got badass because I feel like that's really, that's still looking at the character through this really gendered, like only masculine attributes or valued lens. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, even today, like Sue is very much defined by being feminine, by being a mother. And even before she had her children, she was very motherly. She's a lot older than Johnny and pretty much raised herself and him. Um, she's always had this maternal quality to her she's always been the the one who keeps the team together she does do all that emotional labor like she's the one who can kind of rein ben in and get reed to like Mm -hmm. come out of the clouds and pay attention to them and she's johnny's parent um and that that is fine like there's so many female characters in the marvel universe that like yeah. This is how Sue is. This is not a commentary on how women are. And it's a huge part of her strength. Like she is extremely powerful. She's also like a badass hand to hand fighter. She's brilliant. 
she is she does not stand for bull but she's also very very feminine she's very nurturing she's very warm she does do 90 percent of the emotional labor for the team and that is one of her strengths and i don't think there's anything wrong with that yeah no that's awesome and how is she portrayed in visually in terms of like <laughs> you know obviously a lot of this is during the time of the um gravity defying uh you know there's somehow a bra in that tiny little outfit and you know uh massive amounts of cleavage or other kind of super heroin type things does she get that kind of like very sexified portrayal or is she more in kind of like mom of the group and so oh oh she does at one point um so for the most part her costume is really tame she has literally the same costume as reed and i was gonna say as the boys but ben only wears panties she has the same costume as reed and johnny it's a jumpsuit like Uh uh-huh it's skin tight and it depends on how the artist in like that particular artist draws her um and obviously like you can certainly draw her in that costume with like vacuum sealed breasts moving independently of each other and like Uh the camera's always focusing on her butt or whatever but the actual costume itself is very neutral um however uh There was briefly a time, I I can't even describe it, really. There was briefly a time where she changed her costume to, like, basically a bathing suit with the stomach cut out. And then she has, like, a four cut out over her cleavage. And it's Uh completely ridiculous. I'm sorry. I know that the listeners cannot see this. But I do want you to see it. I I think I have found it. Is it? I I found a picture that's her with blue hair, and um, she's got mm -hmm. like blue thigh high garters on. Blue hair? I know blonde hair. Sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's the one. It's it's um, it sure is something. Um, Uh That was uh, thankfully very short lived. So there have been times in the you know in the eighties and nineties where they really tried to make her sexy because she's not. She's never been a particularly sexualized character because she has those like really right. strong m- wife and mother vibes. Um, right. There's also this whole storyline where she was like possessed. Or she became like this evil version of herself called Malice. And she's wearing this like really skimpy bondagey like black costume. And she's evil, but in a really sexy way. But those mm-hmm. storylines are pretty few and far between. Okay. That makes sense. And so what do you think of Vanessa Kirby as her? Um, I don't know too much about Vanessa Kirby, but I did see her in the early uh, seasons of The Crown, where she played Princess Margaret. uh, And I thought she was... And granted, Princess Margaret is a very dark character, um, who's really wrestling with a lot of family, you know, her own demons and things like that. And very much a party girl with a sort of, like, darkness inside her of all the horrible things she's had to go through. Um, What... Which which doesn't really sound like Sue Storm at all, but she does sound like like a she's a strong actress for sure. What do you know of Kirby and like how do you feel like she fits? I actually I don't think I've seen her in anything. Um, actually, when you when you texted me about <laughs> recording this episode, I was like, oh, I have not done my homework. Like you know how you're always like, hey, have you seen this new superhero movie or TV show? And I'm like, no, I haven't. But I'm almost done with Batman Beyond. <laughs> so i have not seen the mandalorian the last of us the crown the bear or stranger things like i am that's fair so yeah i i i you know what i have seen something with her i've seen jupiter ascending okay she has a very small role in that i mean she looks the part she's a beautiful blonde woman um i for me For me, my concern is always going to be about the writing with Sue and not necessarily like I have faith in the actor if they are given the space and ability to like if they're the support that they need to play the role correctly. I will never forget reading a quote from Jessica Alba. Um, She was talking about filming the second movie, um, Rise of the Silver Surfer, and, you know, out of everybody in those movies, Jessica Alba got dunked on the most and like criticized the most for being a terrible actress. 
But she was talking about the scene in that movie where her character dies. Mm -hmm. And, like, Johnny is, like, weeping over her. And she's crying because she's dying. And she said that the director kept telling her, cry pretty, Jessica, cry pretty. Don't scrunch up your face like that. And there's no actress on the planet who can make that work if you're supposed to look pretty while you're dying. So I know that that phrase is often now used as a like example of the kind of horrific things that women actresses have to go through. Yeah. Um, and the cry pretty. And so I know that, uh, you know, I'm sure there are other times where it has happened that phrase, but it comes apart from here. Yeah. So I'm, I'm much more concerned with like, are they going to make, is somebody going to be saying cry pretty Vanessa or like all the gags in the first, fantastic four movie about like you know her turning invisible and then she her clothing isn't there and then she's visible again and she's naked ha 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 like Mm. if we steer away from that i have i have faith in this actress at least one of the movies i remember i think the michael b jordan one which we'll talk about later that we remember these two based on who played johnny storm um (laughs) but one of the sort of reasons why Doc, the Doctor Doom character, who my understanding is this was a very bad version of Doctor Doom, but a yes. sort of like that he saw himself as a rival for Reed Richards in many things, including for the heart uh, of Sue Storm. Is that something that's from the comics or is that kind of something that was? It's not not from the comics, but it always kind of feels like he's going through the motions. Like he doesn't really seem that into her. It's more like. This is what you do when you're a villain. Right. Um, it, you know, he's like, it's just, it's kind of half-assed. Um, yeah. His history with Reed, they were, they went to college together and um, Doom was like, I'm the smartest person on the planet. And Reed was like, okay. And Doom was like, I'm going to do this experiment. And Reed was like, okay, you've, you've done your math wrong and that's going to go really horribly. And Doom was like, don't tell me what to do. And then he did it and it went horribly and his face was horribly scarred. We've never seen his face in the comics as far as I'm aware. And it's been 60 right. years. Uh, we've never seen it post scarring. Um, and so he has hated Richards ever since. And like, mm-hmm. that's really the pivotal. Right. Like they have this really, really intense relationship um to the point that a couple of years ago he doom got married and he asked reed to be his best man because that reed was the person he was closest to it was so funny um i mean that's very much batman and joker you know yeah yeah um but yeah so sue is sort of when she's used by doom it's much more as like kind of a prop and then as the decades went on he just started hating all of them because they like thwart yeah. him and he like knows that he should not mess with her unless he's prepared to deal with it um but yeah i've just ne- i've never gotten the feeling that he was like yeah. particularly into her it's i just want to take everything from him and so especially in the 60s and 70s that's often going to be i'm going to take his woman kind of an yeah idea. he actually kind of so doom um if there's one member of Reed's family that he would want to take from Reed, it's Reed's daughter, Valeria. Like she calls him uncle doom. She, Cause he saved her life. Like when she was being delivered, they're actually really close. So we can spend so much, so much time on all these characters, but I want to keep going. Yeah. Let's talk about the thing. Uh, ben Graham, who is uh, a very popular character and one that is very close to your heart. Mm-hmm. And that, um, Jessica, I know you've talked before about the lack of uh, good Jewish representation in that there is a number of good Jewish characters and that that's important in part because there are so many of these characters were written by by Jewish authors. Or, um, and so talk about the thing and his Judaism and why that's important and sort of how you felt about uh, 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 Evan's casting. Yeah, so um, Ben is – Ben's the best one. Like – objectively speaking johnny is my favorite member of the fantastic four but i am aware that ben is the best character ben is arguably the best marvel character like it's like ben and spider-man like they're they're the ones he is one Uh of the greatest characters in comic book history bar none um and it's because he has such a a 
powerful and interesting and really unique blend of like humor and um, sort of brashness and like roughness and uh-huh. really deep pathos um, because he is trapped in this in this body that has given him so much, but also that has so deeply alienated him from other people. Like he can't sit on normal furniture. He obviously can't wear normal clothing. Um, He has to be so, so careful all the time. He can never, you know, the others, they're all celebrities, but the others could like put on a baseball cap and sunglasses and, you know, Hannah Montana their way around the world. He can't do that ever. Um, He always has to be the thing. And in the early years, I mean, nowadays, if you you live in the Marvel Universe and you see the thing, you're like, wow, cool, it's the thing. In the early years, when people were not as familiar with him, he was often, people would react like he was a monster because he is a monster. He he, but even though he... Again, there are so many stories about the pathos of his situation. He's also a very funny character. His dialogue is so funny. He's always cracking jokes. He's He has all these, like, cute catchphrases. Like, he'll constantly refer to himself as, like, the ever-loving blue-eyed thing or his Aunt Petunia's favorite nephew. Like, mm-hmm. obviously, there's his it's clobber in time catchphrase. Like, he's he's this really, like, sort of earthy entertaining character who you want to hang out with because he is fun and funny um and he is also deeply deeply loyal and deeply sensitive and just really like his reaction when he finds out that uh reed and sue gave their franklin the middle name benjamin is like Mm. he's 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 just he's got it all (laughs) right no, it sounds really beautiful. And I don't think how to get into this because I feel like as important as it is, I think, to me and, and I know to you and to many others that the, the character's Judaism become a part of how he's presented. I also don't want that to be the whole conversation about either him or or, or what we're having today. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's funny because as you're describing that, I don't think this is exclusive to to you know the Jews I've known both personally and, and, and in, in general – but I think I associate very much with Judaism is a kind of like the world is broken and sad, but let's laugh about it. You know, that kind of like the the finding humor in the sadness and in the pathos. Um, and so say something about like how how that aspect of the character has been portrayed in terms of the journey from it being kind of like coded to explicitly named. And, and I think just start with that before you even get into the actor. Yeah, um, so I would absolutely agree with you. Like, humor out of tragedy is a very Jewish value. And also, kvetching. <laughs> like, he's yeah. a kvetcher. He kvetches all the time, which is extremely Jewish of him. Like, uh, For those who do not know uh, Yiddish or just New York City uh, language, define kvetch for those compl- in America. Complaining. Whining. Yeah. Um, but but, co- but I- not... Ahead, yeah, it's it, not in a, like... It's It's like a humorous, like... Uh, like there, right. there's it's not a negative word yeah. um and it's a way of sort of processing the negative so that you can let it go yeah um my, my yeah. spouse when she first came who's from uh minnesota when she first came to meet most of the jewish side of my family for my sister's wedding at one point said why is everybody so unhappy with everything? And I had explained, like, no, that's not the, this is just how we express each other, you know, express things to each other and the like. Yeah. It's not it to me it's very different than like an actual I can tell when like someone in my family is upset or bothered by something versus when they're just like, Look, the good days I had don't make good stories. But the days when something went wrong on the train or someone was an idiot but when crossing the street in front of me, those make better stories. So that's what I'm going to tell you the story of. Right. There's something about fetching that's like you're. It's it's a little it's performative, not in the sense that you don't feel it, but like in the sense that like you're you're telling a story, like you said, like yeah. you're you're kind of going through it and 
putting like a humorous spin on the like annoying thing that happened to you. Let um, me tell like, you about airline. Let me tell you about airline food is like the right. most kvetch sentence I can hear of. Yeah, you, it's absolutely something that comes like you you that cadence comes out of like the Borscht Belt or you see it reflected in Borscht Belt comedy um, mm-hmm. and a lot of stand up patter. Um, and which is a good segue to like talking about Ben's Jewishness as it's been depicted in the comics. Um, because yeah, like you said, initially it was, it was coded and I don't know how intentional it was. Um, it, it was very much something, it wasn't even necessarily that he was written to sound Jewish so much that he was written to sound like he came from the Lower East Side and most of the Mm -hmm. people who came from the Lower East Side at least not even so much during the 60s but during the time that Jack Kirby grew up that he was drawing on most of those people were Jewish like Jack Kirby was reflecting his own speech patterns and the speech patterns that he grew up with and of course the the sort of connection and you mentioned this at the beginning like uh, the thing is a very um, is understood to be a very autobiographical character for Jack Kirby, and that is to a certain like I don't know what Kirby would say if he were here right now. In a lot of ways, that's you know readers and fans putting that on mm-hmm. him, but m- many people have sort of drawn that line that that line of um, mm-hmm. um, God blanking on the word empathizing with and and um self-representation yeah representation um yeah. i mean between just the idea of ben Grimm being this ta- talented person in his own right but who's always in the shadow of his extremely talented and thus the new you know the media pays a lot of attention to partner with reed richards is very much a jack kirby and stan lee kind of a story i mean absolutely um and uh there's people talk a lot about um one of the recurring gags, um, which stems from the uh, Lee and Kirby era of the Fantastic Four and has continued to this day, is the Yancey Street gang. So the mm-hmm. thing grew up on Yancey Street, which is fictional, it doesn't exist, but it's in the Marvel Universe, it's on the Lower East Side. And he is now, as an adult, constantly bedeviled by the Yan- Yancey Street gang, who are always playing pranks on him. And... But they are good people. Like, they're not villains. They're just mischievous. And they will help the Fantastic Four when, you know, push comes to shove. And I've seen people talk about, like, Kirby was expressing a certain alienation from his background. Mm -hmm. With that, like, the thing can't go home again. Because he's (laughs) battling the Yancey Street gang. He doesn't live on Yancey Street anymore. He lives in the Baxter building. Um but yeah, for a very for decades, the um, the sort of Jewishness and Judaism of which are not necessarily the same thing of Ben Grimm was very much coded, or it was just sort of something that you could like pick up from his speech patterns, but maybe right wasn't. I don't want to say wasn't intentional, but wasn't ever necessarily um, something that was intended to be made explicit, but we do have like a, a a holiday card that Kirby drew one year for Hanukkah that is the thing wearing a uh, yarmulke and Talit prayer shawl and saying happy Hanukkah. Like mm. it's, certainly it's clear that whether that was Kirby identifying himself, like whether he was essentially drawing himself in that card or whether he was saying, here's a Jewish character wishing you a happy Hanukkah or whether he was just going, here's a character I'm famous for drawing happy Hanukkah. We don't know, but that has been seen as sort of the earliest confirmation, although not actually in a comic. Mm. Um, And then Ben was finally explicitly made Jewish many decades after, after Kirby was no longer with us in uh, the early two thousands. I want to say 2001, Um, but there is an issue where he goes back to Yancey street, um, and basically saves a pawnbroker who he knew as a child from a criminal. And when the pawnbroker almost dies, Ben 
praise um, the Shema. He, he, he mm-hmm. prays in Hebrew over him. Um, and the guy's fine. Um, but when the pawnbroker um, recovers, he's like, you know, you're always in the news and they never mention that you're Jewish. I thought maybe you were ashamed of it. And Ben says, no, I just didn't want he was he basically says he was private about it and he he views himself as a monster and he didn't want people to connect that monstrosity with Judaism and the pawnbroker is like you're an idiot <laughs> yeah it's a really beautiful beautiful story um it's a a basically a Yom Kippur story even though it explicitly does not t- like Ben thinks it's Yom Kippur and he's like several months off and it was published mm-hmm. in June um but it's a really, really lovely issue. That sounds like it. Yeah. And and so why was it important for you? I, I think for many people, uh, well, let me rephrase that. So why do you think it's important that the actor be Jewish? Because I, I remember bringing this up to someone when one of the last conversations happened. And the first thought was, well, who cares if he looks Jewish? The character doesn't look Jewish. The character looks like a rock. Um, <laughs> but especially as you talk about like the speech patterns and the like the attitudes, um, talk about why it's been important to you. Or well, why you, you know, think it's important in general? It's, it's funny because I fully admit to being a bit of a hypocrite here because I actually have said many times and will say again that I don't actually think that Jewish characters need to be played by Jewish actors. Be- mm-hmm. Similar to the way that I don't think that queer characters need to be played by queer actors or vice versa, I don't think. Because I think that that, that leads to a vice versa trap where... Right. Jewish actors are pigeonholed into playing Jewish characters and it leads to certain assumptions about who mm-hmm. does and does not look Jewish. Like there were rumors that David Diggs was going to be cast as the thing. David Diggs is Jewish, but a lot of people would not know that looking at him because he's also black. Um, I also think that there is an element again, that parallels between Jewish actors and queer actors of sort of forced outing. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, we have never lived in a world where it is all that safe to be publicly Jewish. And right now um, for, you know, obviously really horrible real world reasons, anti-Semitism as well as Islamophobia are on the mm-hmm. rise. And I just feel like, it's acting, you know, like, it's not yeah. like, it's not like blackface or something where like, it, you're using a prop to change your physical features, unless you're Bradley Cooper, and then you are. Right. Um, all that said, and th- that, that I really I've said that many times, I really believe that. And yet, when I saw the casting, I was like, Oh, thank God, Ben is Jewish. <laughs> so yeah. again, I fully admit that I'm a hypocrite. But for me, it's different with Ben, than it is with like, like, I think we talked about this when we talked about Moon Knight. I was not upset by the Oscar Isaac casting at all. Yeah. Even though, arguably, Judaism is much more central to that character and his story. But for Ben, because he was in a lot... He wasn't the earliest canonically Jewish character because it took him a long time to be canonically Jewish. But in a lot of ways, he was. Right. And... It's just, it's just, maybe it's, I mean, it it could be entirely personal. I identify so strongly with Ben and his Jewishness. Like, he literally reminds me of my grandpa. So. I can see that. And and it's very interesting. There's a couple things I want to comment on. First, part of it, I think, is, and this is probably unfair to any individual context of casting, but it does, it does matter to the overall like how are char- jewish characters or whatever the group is being represented and i'll mm-hmm. speak to one of the examples you talked about 10 years ago i would have said i don't ever want to see a queer character not played by a queer actor and even two years ago i probably would have still said that and then i saw one of the strongest embodiments of masculine masculinity nick offerman play a not that's that um yeah no, nick, never mind. nick offerman play a beautiful depiction of a gay man in um the last of us and his character utterly 
broke my heart and I loved it. And in part because it felt so representative to have this character, this actor who isn't gay, but is very much an embodiment of a lot of things that gayness is often not associated with and be able to say, no, this person too can be this. But in part, that's because there are a lot more queer actors playing queer roles and queer actors playing straight roles. And in the same kind of a way, um, and you and I will probably talk about this character more at some point, Echo, the TV show, is not necessarily my favorite TV show in terms of, like, I think it is the best made. It does give me a lot of hope for the Netflix Daredevil universe coming back in a real way. Yeah, and you're wearing the shirt. But, I mean, Echo is the character who I feel most represented by on screen. And that's odd since I'm talking about a deaf native woman. None of those things are late to, but she uses a prosthetic. And in that case, they specifically wanted a native deaf deaf actress, because I think both of those things are fundamental to the, A, are fundamental to the character, but B, are often, have often been played by people who are not of those communities. But in so doing, it so happened that the best person for the role was also a prosthetic user. And so they, you know, said, let's write that into the character, which is, to me, the ultimate kind of like the non pigeonholing, because not only was it a, well, she has a prosthetic, so she can't play this role, but it's a because she has a prosthetic, let's make the character have a prosthetic as well. Um, all kind of a dial, uh, a tangent, but Echo affected me that much that I'm just going to bring it up whenever I can for the <laughs> next six months because it was it was amazing. Um, Matthew, yeah, you I, know I hate tangents and would never go on one. Exactly, exactly. Especially things related to Daredevil. Um, <laughs> But I, I really like the way you describe that because it does seem like, from the little I know of this character, that is very essential. And I also really liked how you said Jewishness and Judaism as two separate things because there's an extent to which a lot of times when people want to couch anti-Semitism, they won't say, oh, I hate those Jewish attitudes. They'll say, I hate those New York attitudes or I hate mm. that New York humor. And it's one of those times where it is absolutely used as a slur and as a coded kind of anti-Semitism. But there's also a lot of truth to it. And to be honest, I would expect and have, have encountered a higher level of like the conversational Yiddish that is used by many New Yorkers, kvetch, schmuck, like words like this. I would expect a Catholic New Yorker to know those better than a Jewish person who grew up not in a Jewish community in the Midwest yeah. somewhere, you know? And like, so in those regards, yeah, I think it's not, it, I need the character to be a New Yorker, you know? And that is mm-hmm. very much a New Yorker of that time and place. And that is very associated with Judaism. Yeah. And, and I also and really that, appreciate it. Oh, go ahead. No, you go first. <laughs> no, I, I was going to go in a new direction. So you, you Oh, me too. <laughs> well, that, that also speak there, there's sort of a, something in that, Ben doesn't just represent Judaism and Jewishness. He represents a historical New York that is vanishing. Um, He represents the New York cadence of a century ago. Because again, Jack Kirby was drawing on not New York of the 60s for Ben's language, but New York of the 20s. And... Do you know, I live in Manhattan. Do you know how rare it is for me to hear a New York accent? So yeah. there's something, and there is that, as you say, a really, really strong overlap between what people think of as a Jewish accent and what people think of as a New York accent. But ben, to me, Ben sounds like home for for many reasons. And I, I'm excited to hear how Evan yeah. talks. Like, I, 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 I want to hear his patter. When Mary, my spouse, came to New York with me, she didn't. She was like, "I'm, I'm not hearing that New York accent. I don't really have much of it." No one uh, sounds like Bugs Bunny. The the taxi drivers certainly don't. No. Um, but then she met my father, who has you know, my father was born in Rough, Far Rockaway, Queens, in 1941, and so was most of his family, and most of them have much thicker accents. Than, and she was like, oh, that's a New York accent. I was like, yeah, it's the yeah. Brooklyn Jewish accent. I mean, it's Queens, but it's Brooklyn Jewish. You got to go to Staten Island. They got it in Staten Island. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But then well, you'd have I'll... to be in Staten Island. So don't actually. Yeah. 
And I will say, I also love the the point you made about how sometimes when we as fans want to know that an actor is playing a character and the actors had experiences similar to the characters, that does mean that we're often demanding a level of information about the actor that maybe is not fair to ask. And I remember when I first looked up, um, so uh, let me make sure I get the name right. I had it written down and then I look somewhere else. Hold on one second. And so, for example, when I first found out that uh, this person, Evan Moss Bachrock, who uh, I've heard good things about, and I've seen him, but I don't, I don't think I've ever paid much attention to anything he's been in. I haven't seen The Bear, which is the main thing he's known for. We did an episode on something he's been in. He was Micro oh. and Punisher. Oh, you're right. Okay. Yep. Yeah, he's doubling yeah. up on MCU roles. Good for him. Good for him. Um, but my first thought was, is he Jewish? And I have to say, I think it's interesting that the internet has decided he is Jewish enough, he is Jewish, and so all the stories are about a Jewish actor is being cast, which I'm very glad to see because, but, you know, when I look, his Wikipedia page says that he was born, his father is Jewish. And for those who don't know, within Judaism, there are some debates and there are some perspectives, particularly in more uh, orthodox uh, realms of Judaism, that say that you're only Jewish if your mother is Jewish. And I, I, was, I actually commented to another partner of mine who is also Jewish, and we were talking about that. We were kind of bracing ourselves for, is there going to be a debate of, is he Jewish enough? And, you know, does he practice Judaism? Is his white, are his children Jewish? Any of this kind of stuff, particularly because it was his father who was Jewish. And I'm very glad to see, I'm sure that exists somewhere on the internet. I have not seen any of it. And um, I've not seen any, like, you know, here's the synagogue he goes to, or does he go to synagogue, or that kind of a questions. Because, yeah, like, I think I know enough about him to know that he's comfortable with people saying he's a Jewish actor, and that's, we'll see how he appears on screen. And I'm, I, I, I'm, I, I'm glad to know he's Jewish, but I also feel like I don't have a right to know how Jewish he is, and I hope we don't go down that route. Yeah, absolutely. And that uh, well, and that's the other thing that like the reason I keep saying Jewishness and Judaism is because they are obviously related, but they are not necessarily the same thing. And um belonging to the Jewish people as a a culture and an ethno religion um is not the same thing as your actual religious beliefs. Like the fact that there right. are so many Jewish atheists speaks to that. Like yeah. many of my loved ones are Jewish atheists. I would consider myself agnostic, but I'm still Jewish. Um, right. And so, yeah, like that, that, that is private again, like with the, um, yeah. the analogy of queer actors, like I don't need to know what happens in somebody's, private life right like I, did you know um ani defranco the musician yeah yeah she was a, a favorite musician of mine when i was young especially because like when i was coming out as queer she was one of the first openly queer musicians that a lot mm -hmm. of us knew about and she was bi and then she eventually got married to a man and a lot of people were like oh so we need to know who was your girlfriend Ugh. at some point to kind of prove your bi-ness and um and yeah and i would just say i am i am bracing myself because i'm sure some of that will happen I am absolutely positive that at some press junket, someone's going to ask him for his opinion on Israel, Palestine, Gaza, oh, which God. I think is completely – a lot of us should have very strong opinions of that. I certainly do and have talked about them in other formats. The actor being Jewish, like – I yeah, they better ask all four of them. Yeah, I think every famous person should be taking a stand on it. But I think, yeah, I, 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 I know that's going to happen and I'm dreading it. And I'm just – I'm glad that so far there's been very little of that kind of conversation. So we'll see yeah. what happens. Um. What do you know, though, of him as an actor? Because I, I will say I don't remember Micro in the slightest. I haven't seen <laughs> The Bear. I also haven't seen The Bear, but I do remember him in The Punisher. I really liked him. And actually, speaking of Jewish actors, it's a perfect example because he was playing David Lieberman, uh, obviously yep. a Jewish character. And John Bernthal, who is also Jewish, was playing an extremely Italian character. Um, so, you know, it just goes to show that, like, it can be helpful in conveying a character, but we don't need to pigeonhole. Anyway. Right. Um, I, yeah, I liked him a lot um, in The Punisher. He's very much sort of, it, he's, he's a very different character. He's uh, 
very much a non-combatant and he like he argues with frank a lot but he's not like a brawler like ben is Mm -hmm. and obviously his actual physicality doesn't matter at all because presumably he will be cgi like i don't think they're gonna put him in a big chunky suit i i mean i would give my right arm for practical effects with ben but we're not going to get them we're gonna have yeah everybody but sue be cgi all the time which yeah. um which may also help answer that question i asked a while ago of why wasn't this made into a tv show in the the arrow arrow era or something like that probably because the amount of cgi you need to represent these characters on screen i mean even like one of the reasons that they changed ms marvel's powers for her show was because her powers are supposed to be the same very similar to reed's where she mm-hmm. stretches and that's a lot harder to convey in CGI that looks good than the like sparkly powers that they gave her. Um, But yeah, I, I have heard really wonderful things about um, Evan from the bear. Um, And didn't he just win an Emmy? Um, He did. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm excited. Mm -hmm. Um, And the thing, the thing is, um, and this will be a good segue for us. Um, The first two Fantastic Four movies are bad, but the least bad things about them are Johnny and Ben. And what I've heard about the um, Michael B. Jordan version is the same thing. The least bad things about that movie are Johnny and Ben. For some reason, they seem to be easier to get right. Right. Um, So I my my hopes are high in this case. Well, and like I said, I do think it's interesting Jessica Alba is still a name that I recognize and and carries weight, but I think that I, I I don't remember the names of any of the other casting of the others, and certainly none of the others of the the, the more recent one. And I would certainly say that like Chris Evans and Michael B. Jordan are probably the two most recognizable names from all of those. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about Joseph Quinn, who. Well- it's interesting that this is the first time, like, he's a perfectly good looking man, but they didn't pick the most beautiful human being on the planet, which is what they did the last two times, which is interesting. Uh-huh. Um, and like I said earlier, um, Johnny is my favorite. Like, Ben is the best character, objectively the best character, but Johnny is my favorite. I'm just always going to love the, like, flashy, hot headed, like, mm-hmm kind of vain character who loves attention and loves flirting and like you know is sort of like the i like i've said i haven't seen the michael b jordan version i do think chris evans did a pretty good job like if you've seen Mm -hmm. that version of johnny yeah that's 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 johnny he's yeah well like i so I'm trying to think of how to describe Johnny as I understand him. And, and hearing you talk about your love for him, I'm reminded of – it's not Barry Allen. It's the Flash who's very – like it, I, if I remember, there's a version of the Flash who's very much like this. Oh, Wally West. Wally West, yeah. Similar, yeah. I would say that Johnny is like further into that – like Johnny – Johnny is a model. Johnny gets endorsement deals. Like Johnny mm. – uh, there's there's this one great panel that I don't even remember what comic it's from, but like the Fantastic Four has arrived in like Antarctica or something. So three of them are bundled up and Johnny is wearing like uh, swim trunks with flames on them and sunglasses because he can like he's not bothered mm-hmm. by the cold and he wants everybody to look at him. And Johnny is, in fact, a deeply insecure character who has a lot of... Um, deep-seated fears that he doesn't like to talk about and it, it, he uses this facade to hide all of that which of course just makes me love him even more he's yeah. he's much more similar to like booster gold than Wall- mm-hmm. i mean maybe wally west in like the late 80s but like that right. kind of like flashy hot shot yeah well it's gonna be very interesting because first of all i will say looking at his imdb page i'm not positive about this but if i'm reading this correctly he is Joseph Quinn the Eighth. Um, wow! Which you very rarely see like someone beyond the second or third. So that's interesting. Um, oh no! Wait, never mind. That is a um, no. Wait, 
Okay, yes, yeah, yes, yes, it is. <laughs> Joseph Quinn, uh, born 1994. God, I feel old now. Um, oh, God. And, and his list is Joseph Quinn the Eighth. The character he plays in Stranger Things, which is the main thing I know him from, but which I would now watch anything he's ever in because he was so amazing in it, is a version of that, but very different. Y- you've not seen Stranger Things, you said, right? I have not, but I am on the internet, so I'm aware yeah. <laughs> of Eddie... Yeah, he's Eddie Munson. He is the – he's flashy, but in a very, like, I know everyone in the school hates me, so I'm going to have fun being the weirdo because he's the guy – he he DMs the Dungeons & Dragons group in the 1980s when people still think that's devil worship. And he – Oh, yeah. No, Johnny is never the weirdo. Johnny is preppy beyond belief. Johnny, like, I know he's on fire, but even so, he's wearing three polo shirts and all of the collars are popped. Like, he is, he... That's amazing. He's mainstream popularity. He is all five members of a boy band. He actually did have, like, try to have a music career for a while, like, canonically. That's amazing. That's amazing. Okay. He's well, officially yeah, so the that. best singer of the group. Because, so it'd be very interesting because, I mean, as Eddie Munson, he's a very attractive character and I think a very good looking man, in large part because he has gorgeous long hair, which does yeah. not strike me as Johnny at all. No. Um, and so it'd be interesting because I think he he, particularly because, like, you know, I grew up getting bullied for playing Dungeons and Dragons and reading comic books. I'm sure it still exists today, but my understanding is that being a geek is much more socially acceptable among youth today. Uh, But Munson was really still a hero to a lot of us because of that. So I'm there's a part of me that very much wants to hold on. No, he like this actor should play weirdos. No, but I will say the actor is incredibly good at being charming, but also at having a lot of inner vulnerability. Um, which sounds like and he's very, very good at like, I'm scared. I don't understand what's going on. I'm trying to do the right thing. I don't know what that is, which sounds like it is a lot similar to, to Johnny. So, yeah, I mean, the thing you have to remember is in the comics, and I don't know exactly how they're going to handle this in the movie. I don't know if it's going to be an origin story or if they will be established heroes. And like, I mean, you just said he's 30 years old. So, um, he won't be as young as he was in the comics, but in the comics, he was 15 when they got their powers. Like he was a teenager and all of a sudden he was a superhero with this incredibly dangerous superpower and he was world famous. Right. And he had to to cope with that. Yeah. And he, (laughs) there is like for a while he kept going to high school and he thought that nobody knew (laughs) That he was oh, wow. the human torch. And there's like a whole, he was, he was, it was believed that he would be the most popular character when the characters were created because there was the main Fantastic Four comic book. And then there was, a, he had a backup feature in another comic book called Strange Tales. Um, and he was the first one that they spun off into something else. They were like, obviously, like he's young, he's attractive, he's charismatic, he's going to be the most popular character. Um, and they quickly realized, no, actually, Ben, it was then and remains and forever will be by far the most popular character. And then Ben had his own book for mm-hmm. ages and ages. But um, in this this Strange Tales um, backup feature, Johnny was just like living in the suburbs even though he yeah. also lived in Manhattan at the same time, living in the suburbs, going to high school, like, you know, ducking into closets to change into his costume and stuff. And at the end, when they like, fin- you know, they did like 20 issues or whatever. In the last one, he, he like gets caught and he's like, oh no, now you know I'm the human torch. And whoever he's talking to is like, everybody always knew you were the human torch. Are you kidding? <laughs> and he's wonderful. like, oh, wait, really? And they're like, yeah. Yeah. Well- um, We'll see. Yeah, I will he, say you mentioned the actor being thirty years old. Um, two years ago, he very convincingly played a high schooler on a show where some of the actors no longer can convincingly play high schoolers. So yeah, <laughs> I I think they can definitely play him as that. Yeah, I mean, I I don't I think that would be interesting. I don't think it's necessary. Like I said, like I would be really interested in a Fantastic Four movie that's not an origin story because we see so many origin stories Um, Mm -hmm. or they could have him playing a 15 year old or they could not try to find a reason a 15 year old is going into outer space. Like with the, the movies, 
you know, Chris Evans was obviously much younger when he made those movies, but they he was not playing a teenager. He was playing an actual astronaut. Right. Right. That makes sense. Yeah, I'll be curious to see. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation, Jessica. Thank you as always so much. Um, I want to go into so many more uh, parts of this, but uh, we just don't have any time. And I do have a bonus section with you. We're going to talk about some other things that have come out uh, on screen from the comic book pages, most especially Blue Beetle, our favorite Jaime. Uh, but any other kind of last things you want to wrap up with? Um, yeah, just that I'm... I do fundamentally believe that there will never be a what i consider a good superman or good fantastic four movie but i hope i'm wrong because i do think this is a good cast um i do think that superhero movies are in a very different place than they were when the last ones were made um the the promo image of the characters in the 60s really gives me a lot of hope because it seems to understand fundamentally who these characters are so yeah you know maybe they'll break the streak maybe this will be the one i it, hey it's the fourth one so yeah, the, could it be four times the charm could be um yeah i certainly hope so too because you know i am mr grim dark i love grim dark <laughs> and and i think it's a lot of why i generally don't like superman though i i like your version of superman quite a lot the one you tell me about um, and it's funny, though, because also, as you said, that story, it kept being like, oh, the, the, the father figure feels guilty about the harm done to his friend. And and Grimm has all of this, like, reason of resentment. And, like, here's this young man with all these things. Wow, you could do so much Grimdark based on these stories. But I also could see how you, like. You I- could. And they did a bad job. And it was a bad movie. <laughs> exactly. And I think I am. Especially things like Ms. Marvel, which I think, you know, has some, like, seriousness, but is so fundamentally hopeful and happy a show in a way that I really found refreshing um, yeah. and really loved because of it. And really loved also about um, Blue Beetle, which we'll talk about uh, in our members only section that, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to see this. So and when we do, of course, we'll get you back to talk about it. So Excellent. Jessica, for those who uh, you mentioned Book Riot, for those who want to find more of your stuff, uh, where can they find it? Um, yeah, I am a contributing editor at Book Riot. I write about comics over there. Um, I can be found on social media at formerly known as Twitter and Blue Sky as um, at Jess Plummer. Um, uh, you can find my fiction. I have a short story uh, in Swordstone Table, which is an Arthurian retellings um, short story collection. And speaking of Superman, uh, next year, uh, I will have a book about Superman coming out called Even Superman Has Bad Days. Um, it's nonfiction. It'll be out May 2025 from Running Press. So um, That is fantastic. You know, check that out uh, in 13 or 15 months. Okay. Okay. Well, I definitely know we will definitely have you on for our, our book club at some point to discuss that book and, and talk all about it. Uh, and of course, if you want to send in your thoughts, what do you think about the Fantastic Four? I imagine most of my fans know these characters better than I do. What do you think of the discussion? What do you think of these castings? Let us know uh, if you search for The Ethical Panda on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, any of those places you can reach us. You can email me at Matthew at TheEthicalPanda.com. And of course, you just go to the Ethical Panda dot com website there you find all the information about this and my uh other podcast star wars universe pod star wars generations podcast uh, and of course at all those places you can find ways to become a member uh for only five dollars a month fifty five dollars a year you can get access to all of our uh content ad free no ads you get to listen to the content um often it comes out a few days earlier sometimes even a week earlier and we're now starting to do bonus content that is for members only and plus once we start live streaming which we're going to be doing fairly soon we will be doing that with um uh members having a chance to uh participate and ask questions and stuff like that during the live stream so please think about becoming a member please check out all the wonderful things that uh jessica's doing and i especially personally want to recommend her story in uh uh stone sword table is that correct? Swordstone Table. Swordstone Table. It's a great story. I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, check it out. And uh, I hope you remember. We'll keep listening. But for everybody else, we have spoken.